There was a young pastor in Oklahoma City, Putnam City Baptist Church, who had a wife and two children, parents of a daughter, a younger daughter to Brooks, who is the older son. And Pastor Douglas, one evening in his family, encountered something that is unimaginable. And what happened that night is one of the most startling things I've ever known about. I knew Brooks' dad. And when I heard this, I was, it was 1979, I was 20 years of age. I was stunned and shocked by it. Brooks, what happened that night, 1979? Well, thank you, Pastor. Um, like you said, I was 16 years old, and, and we lived on a, <clears throat> a small farm just outside of Oklahoma City. And uh, one night, a couple of guys came to our front door and asked for help, which was something that we would do for people. And they, they needed to use the phone. And so I let them in, and within a few minutes, they had pulled guns on us. They uh, had hogtied us on our living room floor, hands and feet behind our back, and uh, they had molested my younger sister. They uh, then sat down, ate the dinner that my mom had been fixing, and then they shot us all in the back, left us for dead, and my mother and my father both died there in front of me. And you actually heard the last breath of your parents right. as you're there. And... Um, and your sister and you survived somehow the shooting. They, now imagine this, they're on the floor and these guys, these were drifters and kind of, they were drug right. related. So they start shooting them on the floor and, and then they leave. So what happened? Uh, we were able to get free and, or Leslie and I were able to get free. We, uh, I was able to drive us to a doctor's house that lived in the In that condition you were able to, you were barely driving at 16, but now you're driving in this condition and you get to the hospital. Right. Uh, they began to work on us and got us to a, a bigger hospital in Oklahoma City where we could uh, be treated for that. And then uh, we weren't able to go to our parents' funerals. We were in the hospital for almost three weeks. And, and uh, uh, because we were in intensive care, we weren't able to go. But uh, eventually got out of the hospital. And yeah, so you recovered from the physical injuries, but recovering from the emotional side, both you and your sister had a long road. Absolutely. Went through. Uh, they caught the guys that, that shot us. Uh, they killed two other people here in Texas in the meantime, and then uh, they were tried, both found guilty, and both given the death sentence at that time. And so, what did you do? As a 16-year-old young man, you had to get on with your life. How did you go about that? What did you do next? Well, I, as, as we were talking about earlier, I, I had, uh, I knew that I should forgive, but I knew that that was a long, long ways away. I, I was in no mind to even think of that. But I, I do remember praying, God, I'm not, I can't do this right now, but this is, I'm, I'm willing to be, to go down that and road. And your dad made preached really. forgiveness and in fact had just preached some message the previous week on forgiveness. The, the morning before, right, on Sunday morning, he, he died on Monday night and the, the, his, ser his sermon that day was about His last sermon was on forgiveness. Right. I'm not counting on this one being my last sermon, but <laughs> You know, it could be, seriously. You ought to always preach as though it's your last sermon. You ought to always listen as though it's the last sermon you're going to hear, by the way. So, Amen. Uh, so, you know, you weren't ready to forgive, so you go to college, you come to Baylor, right? Right. And uh, you get a law degree. Right. And then you go to armed forces. Right. And special forces, in fact. Right. So, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that a lot of the rage and the anger that must come from this, I mean, you just you know, you, you, you got involved in your schooling. I, I know that's what I did. And, you know, I just kind of started moving on uh, with my life to try to get past all this. Um, and you became a, uh, a special forces guy. That means he could break your neck with one snap. <laughs> Don't try. In fact, would you be my personal security from this Absolutely, day? Absolutely. Right. You got it. No, I got good security, <laughs> I think. Uh, well, but then you were elected at the age of 26. Right. Ran for office in Oklahoma on a mission, elected senator at age 26 of the Oklahoma Senate. And your purpose out of your pain was what? Uh, criminal justice and victims' rights. Criminal justice, 
victim's rights. Kind of what we talked about from Romans 12 and Romans 13 there, how God ordains government to protect us and to execute judgment and imprisonment or whatever is needed. Uh, and so, as a victim of violent crime, and I've been there, sometimes you feel like you don't have a voice. So, you wanted to give people a voice. Absolutely. There, there were a lot of bills that we were able to get passed. There was almost nothing on the books, at least in Oklahoma in those years. And, and so, uh, that's where I went to work, is to try to get rights for crime victims and to give them a voice in the system. And as a result of your being a senator and working on this, then the moment came when you are about to be in the presence of one of the murderers of your parents. Tell us about right. that. Well, it wasn't anything that was planned. I, I was uh, speaking at the prison that day to, to a leadership group and uh, really out of fear that I was going to turn a corner and run into the, to one of the guys that was then in general prison population. I, I, I started asking where he was. The next thing I know, you I'm started asking, in front of the where guy. is he? I yep. bet they were a little nervous about they, that. They were really nervous. The, the warden said he watched his career flash before his eyes as uh, he was ultimately doing that. Uh, but because yes, you didn't really know what you would do if you confronted him, right? Not at all. Not at all. And in, in fact, like you were saying, I, it, it, that was the first time that my life began to make sense. In the few minutes before I walked in to meet with him, it was like, okay, now I know why I became a lawyer. Now I know why I became a state senator. Now I know why I went in the army and, and learned how to do cool stuff. It's just, it was, that was the, you know, that was the point of justice. Yeah. And uh, turns out God had other plans. And so you go in there not knowing exactly what's going to happen. You do get permission to visit. What was his name? Glenn Ake. Glenn Ake. I remember that name. Glenn Ake. And you go in to just visit with him. And what happened? Well, I wasn't, I wasn't sure when I walked in if both of us would come walking back out and really didn't care which one of us it was that, that didn't. But, and, and I remember saying to him, you know, my parents, uh, my father was a minister and my parents taught me that I should forgive. But I said, that's not why I'm here. That's not what this is about, and, and that's not what's going to happen. And, and he, you know, he understood. And, um, and, and I remember over, I kept him there for an hour and a half because he had, he had apologized. And I just wanted to see, is this guy for real? And, and after that hour and a half of trying to provoke him and trying to get angry myself, it, it, it didn't happen. And, and I realized, I began to realize more and more that God had a different plan for what was going to happen in that meeting. And had he become a Christian? <clears throat> yes. He, he said, uh, he told me that he had become a Christian since he was in prison. And I said, that's, you know, that's great. And <clears throat> my parents would be happy for you. And I don't care. So you had the meeting and it went okay. You didn't, you didn't break his neck. Right. Uh, and you're walking out. And then <clears throat> as I got to the door, Really, it just felt God's presence. I remember feeling like God was telling me, this isn't over. You, there's more you need to do. And, and I walked back over to the table, and I, I looked at him, and I said, you know, again, my parents taught me that I should forgive. But, and then I said, I forgive you. And, and it was not only completely unexpected, but it was, I just remember falling back in the chair and feeling like, and you know, my body had been full of poison for, for 15 years, and that, and that it, and I could almost physically see this flooding out all over the floor, you know, around me. And I, and I felt like, that like a, somebody took a clamp off my chest that I didn't even know was there, and I could suddenly breathe for the first time in 15 years. It, it was a completely physical, you know, feeling and, and, and an experience and a manifestation of, of what, was, what was happening. And you found forgiveness and the freedom that forgiveness uh, gives. And now Brooks is on another mission, and that is to tell this story uh, to people in prison, uh, to people who are in prisons of their own making. And it's called The Amendment. The Amendment is the movie. And it's a message that, on forgiveness that will radio resonate to everyone. And it's a well, you tell us about it. It's, uh, it's a one night only. Uh, what are these called? I can't think of it. Fathom them. events. What? Fathom events. Fathom event. events. There you go. So it's a one night explosive evening. Tell us about what's going to happen. Uh, April 12th, it's, uh, it's on at theaters across the country. A lot of them right here in North Dallas, including Cinemark uh, down the street. And it's, uh, 
It's at 7 o'clock, and so you can buy your tickets uh, either through Fathom or on our website, theamendmentmovie.com. And, um, yeah, again, tell your friends all across the country that, that, it's, that it's on. It's in 730 screens. 730 screens. This message is going to be shared. Aren't you glad? And aren't you grateful for Brooks and his willingness to share his story? Thank you, brother. God bless you. I love you.